Thank you. Well, I will try and live up to being entertaining, no guarantees. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I am the second oldest of got five kids. Um, I'm a military brat. Um, and so is anybody else here a military brat or part of a military family? Couple. So you know that we aren't really from anywhere, but we're really from everywhere. Um, it's really interesting being out in Elk City. They're like, you don't have an Oklahoman accent. No, I don't. Um, I was born in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, lived in Germany when the wall came down. Lived in Oklahoma uh, in third grade and then again in sixth grade because dad had to retire at Minot in fourth and fifth grade. So a little bit of everywhere. A um, little bit about my family. My dad's a convert. Um, he is from upstate New York. He's the only, he was the only Catholic in his family. In fact, he uh, found the faith by himself when he was 13. Um, he came from a family of yours, mine, ours, his, hers, and theirs. Um, both of his parents had been married, remarried, 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 and sleeping with a girl down the street type, type relationships. Um, so he was from upstate New York, joined the military, um, enlisted. My mom is from Los Angeles. Um, she is from a cradle Catholic family. Um, she is the second oldest of five kids as well. And um, dad is the oldest of 26, 27 of the yours, mine, ours, his, hers, and theirs. Um, I, I honestly don't know how many aunts and uncles and haves and steps and are really there. I've only met nine of them um, in my life. Um, but she's from L.A., he's from New York. They met and got married in Izmir, Turkey. That's how the Air Force works. Um, that you, you come from all over, um, and it was the faith that brought them together, actually. Um, and so um, I'm cradle Catholic, um, as I said, second of five kids. And the church was very important to my family growing up. Um, in fact, until the age of 18, I had missed Mass twice only twice. And as a priest, I realized that's a real, rare, very, very rare thing. I thought growing up that everybody went to Mass every week, and you had to go to Mass. And then I became a priest and realized that you, the, the majority of your good Catholics, two to three times a month is about what you expect. Um, I didn't realize that growing up because, again, I would missed Mass twice. Missed Mass twice, once because I had a chicken pox and they wouldn't let us in the church, and the other time because we got snowed in. Now, when I say snowed in, I don't mean Oklahoma snowed in, where there's... <laughs> I mean North Dakota snowed in, where we couldn't open the garage because it was taller than all of the Grovers, which doesn't take much. But um, for those of you who know my family, I'm the tallest in the family, and I take pride in that. Um, I'm, all, all, my height of 5'6 is just staggering to my siblings, who are 5'3 and 5'2, and mom, who's 5'3, and dad was 4'11 and a half, and sisters are 4'9 and 4'10. So. Um, we are um, big in stature, just not in height. Um, and so uh, went to school in military bases, uh, went to school off base, went to more public schools um, growing up. And so St. Andrews was our home uh, when we moved here in 93 for the first time. Uh, Father George Pupius, may he rest in peace, uh, was our pastor um, when we moved there. My first real um, encounter with um, the charismatic movement, I'd never heard of it. Um, Again, before we moved to Oklahoma, we lived in Germany, and so you went to the base chapels. I didn't realize until I joined seminary that base chapels and parish churches are not the same thing. Um, I didn't realize that at the base chapel, they had a flip around crucifix. Did you know this? In most base chapels, they have a cross that then you flip around, it can become a crucifix because Protestant services take place in the same prayer space. And they don't want the crucifix. We as Catholics do. Um, and so I didn't realize that. Um, and kind of grew this new appreciation for kind of the charismatic uh, movement under Father George. Well, uh, when we moved here in 93, Dad had three years left in military service, so we thought, okay, we're going to retire in Oklahoma because, again, one coast is one family, one coast is the other. What better place to live than in the middle of the two of them in Oklahoma? And the military said, ha, 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 bless your heart. Um, and so the next summer we moved to North Dakota um, for uh, two years, um, which are probably two of the worst years of my life. Um, and uh, I mean that in a very real way. I was bullied a lot, picked on a lot, as most of us were at some point in our childhood, <clears throat> but that was a very um, negative part of my life. Um, got bullied mercilessly. Moved back to Oklahoma, went to the same school in sixth grade that I went to in third grade, so watching all these movies, when I look back, it's like, oh man, I should have played the, yeah, they sent me off to juvie, I got in trouble. No, we were in military, and we just got moved back to the same school. Um, so we moved back, um, St. Andrews was our home again, um, and uh, Father George was moving on uh, from St. Andrews, and our new pastor was coming in in the fall of 1997, 
who finally retired after 25 years in the same parish last summer, Father Jack Feely. Um, so Father Jack was my pastor from six, six, halfway through sixth grade all the way through seven years being a priest. Um, we have our ups and downs as we do with most priests. Um, and he was actually one of the first priests that actually asked me, hey, have you thought about a call to the priesthood? And my typical response would have been, no, I like girls. Um, I want to I get married. I come from a big family. Um, and I want to have kids. I want to have sex. I want to have a wife. I want to have a family. I want to be normal, what was kind of my response to him. Um, but at the same time, in the back of my head, even though I didn't realize there was a call and vocation there, God had put it there. And a lot of people around me had seen it as well. And so I went from more public schools um, to Bishop McGinnis High School um, as a freshman back in the uh, fall of 1999. Um, so my first real interaction with the school um, a as a student was the summer before um, where we had had uh, Father Hamilton's ordination, um, being the last priest to have graduated from Bishop McGinnis, and he was ordained in 1999. And then they had the 50th anniversary of the school. I got to celebrate Mass with Archbishop Beltran. And I'll never forget at Mass, he'd always ask servers, even until I joined seminary and thereafter, he would always say to the male servers, what are you waiting for? Why aren't you calling my office? Why aren't you going to seminary? Um, and it's like, what is seminary? I, I'm a ninth, ninth grader. I'm dumb. I don't know what's going on. Um, and so it just kind of out of sight, out of mind, in one ear, out the other. Um, but I went to Bishop McGinnis um, in high school, and the summer before uh, my high school, I mentioned I had been bullied a lot in fourth and fifth grade. Um, I was your typical um, depressed teenager, um, thought the world was against me. I went from being the baby of the family to the middle child, to the other child, to the other other child. Because um, when you go from being number two to number uh, one of two of two, to two of three, to two of four, two of five, you kind of lose your place, um, or you feel like you lose your place in your family of origin. And so for me, I didn't feel like I fit in my family. Um, and so I went to church a lot, went to youth group. Um, I went on Wednesday nights. I went to Bible study on Thursday nights. I went to youth group on Saturday nights. I went to religious education on Sundays. And you think, oh, very holy Catholic kid. I hated my family. And my, my response to that was, let me go hang out with my friends who are at church. Um, and so by the grace of God, there was a Catholic Heart Work Camp that we were going to the summer of 1999 in Mesa, Arizona. And I went not to find God, not to serve, but to get away from my family. On um, the summer before that, I had, I had started cutting. Um, I was depressed. I considered taking my own life. And God's like, eh, no, that's not going to happen. And so I went to this uh, work camp in Mesa, Arizona, um, in Phoenix, Arizona, actually. But the first night we got there, we had mass at a church in Mesa, Arizona called St. Timothy's Catholic Church. Um, some people may have heard of it. Some people may not have. Life Teen is, was founded there. Um, and so we went to uh, mass there. And I'll never forget the psalm from mass that day was Psalm 23. And the refrain, um, the, the version that they took was by a Christian artist at the time uh, known as Kathy Tricoli. Um, and her version of Psalm 23, the refrain goes, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, you are with me. And that stayed with me, that version of it, that refrain, for about six months. To the point where I could sing it. Didn't know who sung it, didn't know where it came from. My parents heard it enough. My dad actually found the CD, dating myself, but the CD that it came from, and that was my Christmas present that year for my parents, was a CD with that version of Psalm 23. And it was in the middle of that Mass, I broke down. Um, I didn't know what had happened. Um, I, I came back completely different to the point where my older brother, um, Chris, who's uh, now a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, said, Danny, what's wrong with you? I said, what do you mean what's wrong with me? Nice to see you too. He's like, you're smiling. I haven't seen you smile in a long time. Something has changed. In hindsight, as we always say, hindsight's 2020. God had, for the first time, I'd allowed him in without realizing it. It's that old saying, you open a door and the Lord finds a way in. And so I had opened my heart for the first time really to receiving the Lord, cradle Catholic, but had never really understood the idea of having a relationship with God. Um, I knew a lot about God, but I didn't really know God. And so when I went to Bishop McGinnis, um, 
my faith continued to grow. Um, I went on every retreat that I needed to go on. Um, I went uh, to Kairos and then became the rector for Kairos my senior year. Um, I was voted most likely to join the, the seminary. I'd never heard of really seminary by my senior year in high school, which is why I kind of pushed things off. Um, and so when I graduated from McGinnis with a 3.9 GPA, I'll take it, um, I went off to OU, um, didn't know what I wanted to do. And so my mom, um, again, hindsight is 2020, and honor your father and your mother. Um, my mom said, hey, Danny, you really don't know what you want to do. Wouldn't it be better if you go to community college first? Telling a 17-year-old they don't know what they're doing, good luck. My response, and again, I look back on this and say, oh, cannot believe you were that prideful. Cannot believe you said these words to your mom. Mom, community college is for those that can't make it in the real world. Forgetting the fact that my mom herself had gone to community college for two years. And so I went to OU, um, thinking that I knew better than everything. Um, and after the three semesters, I dropped out with a 1.3 cumulative GPA. A lot of it had to do with, I didn't go to class. It wasn't partying, it wasn't alcohol, it wasn't girls, it was video games. Um, I was born in the wrong generation. Nowadays, you go, to, you go to college to play video games and get scholarships for it. Back then, you go play, play um, video games and you fail out of college. So it's a crazy world we live in. But I also stopped going to church. If you've ever been to OU, you know it's not very far from Walker Dorm to St. Thomas More. I didn't go. Uh, my roommate was Catholic. My brother was Catholic, still is Catholic. Um, but we just, I just didn't go to Mass. Um, even though it was free meals, I didn't go to Mass. Um, I played a lot of video games. I worked at uh, the Burger King on campus and didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And so I'll never forget, I went to the Olive Garden in Norman one day, uh, my third semester, to my parents and said, um, I think I'm going to drop out of school. To which I was expecting, no, you can never do that. They said, yeah, that's a good idea because we want to stop paying for you to waste your life. It's like, mm, touche. Um, so I came back home um, with the um, notion that I can take one year off. Anything more than that, I will never go back to school. I just know the way that my brain chemistry works. It's not going to happen. Just took a year off, worked for um, an asbestos abatement company um, that did air quality control um, and uh, worked for them for a year. Hated every moment of it, but got paid, got a car, 20, 21 years old. What more could you ask for than to have all your bills paid and to have a free car that they pay for the gas and they pay for your food? Awesome, right? Um, not when you make $1,500 before taxes a month. Um, but I didn't really know much better. And um, it was during that time that I'd really kind of, for the first time, considered a vocation. Because we put the pumps out in the morning, checked them every few hours to make sure they were still running, and then I basically had six to eight hours a day to do whatever I wanted to as long as I was sitting in the office. I read every book, I watched every DVD, I played every video game, I got bored, so I said, you know what? I've never read the Bible. Never read it cover to cover. And so I went thinking, this is the best way to read the Bible. You start with Genesis, you end re with Revelation. There's nothing better, right? Obviously, no, that's not quite really the best way to go about it. And my pastor at the time told me that um, in a way that I wasn't ready to receive it. Um, he was asking me about one of the stories um, from the book of Genesis when I was trying to tell him what I was doing. And uh, sometimes what we hear and what people say aren't always the same thing. What he said was, hey, Danny, think before you speak, think before you act. What I heard was, Danny, you're a moron, you're never going to succeed. Um, and when you hear that from the pastor, the first thing you want to do is, the heck with you, I'm out of here. Um, and so for about six months, the idea of a vocation was off my mind. Um, and this was two, two years before I actually joined seminary. And so um, I stopped working with that company, um, had to go to church because I had to move back home. Dad's rule was always my house, my rules. Live under my roof, you go to church. In fact, when his mother lived with us multiple times, she went to church um, because she lived at the house. Little did I know until after I joined seminary, until after she had already passed, that five years before she died, um, she actually became Catholic um, because of dad's prayers and influence. Um, and so when I was uh, living at home, um, working for DirecTV technical support, so if you called from 2005 to 2007 DirecTV technical support for resolution specialist, you talk to me. Um, <laughs> and you never really know what things God's going to put into your life to kind of help you down the road. Working for DirecTV made me a better confessor, made me a better pastor, made me more compassionate and made me the person that everybody goes to for IT. Um, in fact, I remember 
first semester in seminary when we were at Conception, our direct TV sports channels weren't working. And so the rector comes to me and says, hey, Danny, you used to work for direct TV, right? Yeah, fix it. Because we were only getting Big Ten channels and we weren't getting Big 12 channels. And in Missouri, that's back when Kansas and Missouri were all still in the Big 12. You got to get your football games. And so I called up my buddy who was working. I was like, hey, do me a favor. Look at this account. Fix this. Right away, got our games. Um, but, but, but I learned, long story short, to kind of um, use those different gifts, talents, and skills that God had given to me as a child, um, as an adult. And so I was going to Oklahoma City Community College at this point, living at home, paying my way through school. Um, because my parents said, well, we, you've spent all the money that we had put aside for you, and you wasted it. So if you're going back to college, it's on your dime. So I was working 40 hours a week. Um, for direct TV, going to classes, three to four classes a semester. Um, I had a 4.0. It's amazing what happens when you actually go to class. Um, and I, I remember one fateful day, I was um, driving home from school, put my blinker on um, to turn south on May, coming out of Oklahoma City Community College. The thought that, didn't, the thought that came to me wasn't, I want to be a priest, wasn't, I want to be a seminarian. It was the most prideful thought that I could have possibly ever had. I wonder how long the autobiography for the application for seminary is supposed to be. That was the thought that came to mind. And again, you open your heart a little bit, and the Lord will kind of kick his way in. So I called Gene Mulligan, who's the vocation director, uh, the secretary um, in the vocation office at the time, who's now Anna. And I said, hi, this is Danny Grover. I tried applying for seminary a few years ago. Strange question for you. How long is the autobiography supposed to be? Expecting like 15, 20, 30, 40 pages. A page and a half, it's like, I've already got 17 pages. She said, you aren't that interesting. Trim it down. Um, so little did I know that that um, kind of inspired the vocations office to contact my pastor. Remember the pastor I didn't get along with because um, we had gotten into a fight about a year and a half earlier. And so I get a phone call from Father Feely. And he says, huh, Danny, I hear thinking about seminary again. We need to talk. It's like, oh. I would rather hear, I'm upset with you than we need to talk. Those are just words you don't, you, you don't like to hear in any relationship. And so we went and sat and talked for about three and a half hours. Had one of the best conversations I've ever had with Father Feely in my life. He told me about his own struggles with his vocation, um, how he'd be kicked out of this seminary, kicked out of this diocese, kicked out of this seminary, kicked out of this diocese, but that he knew that he was called to vocation. And so at that time, I said, Lord, I have tried things my way time and time again and I have gotten so many spiritual nose jobs by falling flat on my face, I'm going to apply for seminary. If I get in, I get in. If not, this is your one opportunity. I'm out. And so I got in. I'm like, well, that didn't go as my plan. Um, it's, that, it's that old saying, you make a plan and God just kind of laughs in your face sometimes. Um, so I was like, <laughs> bless your heart, Danny. We're going to try seminary. And so I went off to seminary. I'll never forget after my first semester at uh, Conception Seminary, calling up Father Novak and saying, I don't think this is for me. Um, I, I just don't know um, if this is going to work. Um, and, and he said something to me that stayed with me throughout my whole eight years of seminary. He said, Danny, every day is not going to be easy. As long as you feel 51% called, don't leave. And that stayed with me. And so from then on, I always kind of took a, a litmus on those bad days of a, well, I'm at about 73%, but I'm not at 50 I'm still above 51, and so, so I'd kind of go back and forth with myself, kind of assessing, do I feel called, do I not feel called? And so when I met with um, Archbishop Beltran um, to go through the seminary application, he said, um, I'm going to ask you for at least one year. Give us one year of seminary, and then if you decide you want to leave, you can leave after that, but one year. And so he also said, the beauty of seminary is it's a place of discernment. And when you're discerning, you don't have to really commit until you make your vows of diaconate. My problem was I took that to heart and didn't realize that I had wasted the first three years of seminary because, hey, Archbishop Beltran said I don't have to commit, so I had one foot in, one foot out. I was too busy trying to both live the life of a seminarian and at the same time still be that kid that didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. In fact, um, I, I'll never forget um, my interviewers were Nancy House, who I ended up working with for two summers out at the Catholic summer camp, um, Father Stansberry, Father Novak, and Sister Kathy. She was terrifying. 
She was one of the most terrifying, in not Sister K, no. Yeah, she, she was the school superintendent when I graduated high school, but no. Sister Kathy, it was one of those where I never felt more intimidated by a woman in my life than when I interviewed with her. And, and look, I, I went back and we've talked a lot. Amazing woman, amazing, amazing woman. And a lot of it was she wanted to make sure that if I'm going to commit my life to this and the diocese was going to commit their funds and their resources to me being there, that I actually wanted to be there and that I wasn't just kind of going through the motions. And so I was, again, one foot in, one foot out um, for the first three years of seminary at Conception Seminary College. And it wasn't until my um, uh, exit interview, kind of going on to theology, that the rector kind of made this known to me because I didn't realize it. Um, it's kind of like when you see yourself in the mirror every day, you don't see how you change, but everybody else around you can see how you look different. It was that same way for me. And so... He said to me um, at the exit interview with Father Novak there, who was the vocation director at the time, he said, um, at best case scenario, on the path that you're on, you'll make an average priest. Because until you get off the fence, you're going to do no good for anyone. And I took that and I said, who do you think you are again, being a 22, 23-year-old individual thinking that I know better than everybody, and um, went off to St. Meinrad School of Theology. And so I was three years into seminary, and ironically, this was not planned, I promise you. Today's gospel has a big part of my vocation finally giving in. We had a seven-day silent retreat, and in that retreat we had today's gospel. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and die, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it can bear much fruit. And for the first time, it clicked that I have to die to myself. I have to die to my past to be able to bear much fruit for God in the future. And, and that was one of the things that I really didn't understand in life was that it's not about me. But we hadn't gotten Fulton Sheen's book yet, The Priest is Not His Own. And so I hadn't read through that yet. We actually got it later that year. Uh, that one as well as The Priest of the Third Millennium um, from Cardinal Dolan. And I, I had thought that this is all about my vocation and my vocation and my vocation. And I realized... Danny, it's not about you. It's about how you're called to serve the people of God. Um, and so about a year and a half later, um, on Valentine's Day, uh, we were installed as um, acolytes um, for um, uh, in the seminary, one of the, the minor orders, old school minor orders, on the way to ordination. And that night I got called into the vice rector's office where he told me, with Father Novak sitting there again, um, Danny, we aren't recommending you on unless you take a pastoral year. Of which Father Novak said, Danny, we haven't had pastoral years in our diocese in over a decade. To which my response was, so what does that mean? I had about seven months of uncertainty. Um, he said, finish out the semester, we'll figure it out after that. At the end of the semester, um, was uh, 20, 2012, my, grandpa, my grandfather died um, in, in LA. And so I came back from that to clinical pastoral experience at Baptist Hospital. Um, which was the worst and best 10 months and, or 10 weeks I never want to have to ever do again. Um, uh, <laughs> Father John Paul's like, yep, nope, never again. Um, b b because it, it wasn't about hospital ministry as much as it was trying to call you out of who you think you are and help you break down so we can rebuild you up. Um, but it wasn't specifically a Catholic program at Baptist Hospital. It was actually run by a lot of non-Catholics. And so you have Catholics and non-Catholics in this program together and they didn't want you to do anything Catholic. And so it's like, eh, I can't do this. Um, so halfway through that program, I got a phone call from Father Novak saying, hey, um, we'd like to offer you a pastoral year. Would you take it? Said, yes, please, 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 anything. Yes, I, I feel like this is where I need to be. And so I did a pastoral year at St. Charles um, out in War Acres, one of the best years of discernment in my life. Um, I am not, <laughs> it's one of those, I am not a smart man academically. Academically, I've always struggled because I have ADHD. And so it's hard for me to focus. And so even in class, and Father John Paul can attest to this, I'd be playing video games on my laptop while taking notes because I can't focus on one thing. And so getting me out of the classroom and into the practical environment of, here, let me teach. So I helped out with confirmation. I helped out with RCIA. I helped out with teaching second grade. I worked in the school. I did this. I did this. I was all over the place, and I loved it. But Sundays for me were like 17-hour days. And I thought, man, that's exhausting, but it is so amazing 
to do the will of God and to do this. And so I went back after my pastoral year and the seminary gave the same response that my brother had about 15 years before and said, what happened? What changed? I said, well, you finally got me out of the classroom and now I know what it is I need to learn to be able to be a good, effective, holy priest. Went back to St. Meinrad. Last two years of seminary were a breeze, were amazing. Um, I was actually made um, one of the prefects of, uh, they split up into houses like some of the, the uh, junior or the, the uh, grade schools do here. So we had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, go figure. So I was the uh, prefect of the house of John. Um, my uh, diaconate year there did amazing. A and uh, my first year as a priest, I was assigned to um, St. Joseph's in Norman, thinking, okay, I'm going to be an associate for eh, five to 10 years, because that's the average, right? It's not. Um, but, but, but that was my assumption. And so um, when I got a phone call in um, May of 2016, right after I'd in my first year of ordination, I was sitting in the hospital. Um, I had just checked myself into the emergency room um, because I was experiencing vertigo for the first time. Not a fun feeling uh, for those of you who've had it. It's one of those like, oh, the whole world is spinning. It's like, I didn't have any alcohol, didn't do any drugs. Why is the world spinning? What's going on? And so I'm uh, getting my blood pressure taken um, and I had a Fitbit at the time and I see on my Fitbit, Archbishop Coakley. They said my blood pressure went up immediately. They said, what just happened? I said, well, the archbishop's calling me. It's like, well, ignore him. It's like, <laughs> easier said than done. Um, so I ignored the phone call and um, they let my heart rate come back down. Um, and I called him back. It's like, hey, archbishop, this is Father Grover. How can I help you? Well, are you in a good place? Like, well, I'm in the hospital right now. Are you okay? Well, I don't know. I've got vertigo. And what should I call you back? It's like, I'm not going anywhere. What's going on? He said, um, I'd like to um, ask if you would um, uh, accept the um, assignment to become the uh, new administrator at Corpus Christi uh, Catholic Church, St. Robert Bellarmine Catholic Church, and chaplain at Bishop McGinnis. To which my first response was, you know my dad is the campus minister at McGinnis, right? He said, eh, you guys can figure it out. Um, I said, well, I, I, yes, Archbishop, I, I guess I'll accept that. I wasn't expecting to move this year. It's like, well, we weren't expecting to move you either, but um, th this assignment will be um, uh, active on um, July, uh, or on June 28th um, in just six weeks. Would you accept it? Yeah, yes, Archbishop, I will. So little did I know I would be an associate for literally 365 days. Um, I moved into uh, the rectory at Christ the King for my first year um, as the administrator at Corpus Christi, St. Robert Bellarmine, and chaplain at McGinnis, um, of which I had to get the rectory ready at Corpus Christi. Um, it, it's the original rectory um, of the building. There was mold, there was asbestos, there was just horribleness in the basement that we had to get all cleared out. Uh, moved in with no air conditioning, no heat, um, no central heat and air. Even by the time I, I moved out um, two and a half years ago, we had window units and uh, heaters because it's one of the poorest parishes in the diocese. Um, and so I moved in and spent uh, five awesome years as chaplain of McGinnis, um, four and a half awesome years as pastor, well, three and a half years as pastor, one year as administrator at Corpus Christi in Oklahoma City and St. Robert Bellarmine in Jones. And, I, and I've learned so much in the eight years I've been ordained. Basically, looking back, I learned about 25% of what I needed to learn to become a priest by the time I got ordained after eight years, which is crazy. Um, when couples go through marriage prep and say, why do we have to take six months for marriage prep? We know what we're doing. It's like, <laughs> the annulments and divorces I go through say that you don't. Um, but it's the same way with formation. Um, even after eight years of seminary, there's so many things you have to learn on the job. Um, I didn't know what a finance council did when I became a pastor because I'd never gone to the finance council meetings my one year as an associate. I had um, never done a budget before. Um, I was actually told... Um, in, in seminary, um, that you'll always have people at the parish that can do the finances for you. Like, obviously, you haven't been to rural Oklahoma um, because some of the parishes, it's the pastor is in charge of everything. You write checks, you sign checks, you, you're in charge of the books, you're in charge of the sacramental records, you're in charge of everything. Praise be to God, I haven't had that experience yet. Um, but uh, it, 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 there's so many things you have to learn kind of um, as being a priest. And as a priest, it is the craziest life that I would never give up. Um, I had gone into seminary not knowing what the word discernment meant. I thought discernment meant prayerfully thinking about something. 
I learned finally my last year in seminary, after I'd already been ordained a deacon for six months, that discernment is more of living so as to be. If you're discerning a vocation to the married life and you aren't dating, you aren't discerning a vocation to the married life. If you're discerning a life to the priesthood and you aren't going around and either checking out religious orders or seminaries, you're not really discerning a vocation to the religious life. And so I wish I had learned that seven and a half years earlier. I think it would have made the first five years a little easier on me, um, though I am a little pig-headed, so I'm not quite sure. Um, but my parents supported me throughout the whole thing. Um, it was actually pretty awesome the last five years of seminary. My dad had started the diaconate program, um, and so he was ordained a deacon um, nine months before I was ordained a deacon. And actually, um, that would have been 10 years ago uh, next month um, because the same weekend he was ordained as a deacon was my 10-year reunion from high school, my 20-year 20 20 reunions this week. So I remember it's very close in that time. I got to work very closely with my dad. He was the campus minister at Bishop McGinnis. I was the chaplain. Um, so for five of the years, for four and a half of the five years that I was there um, as chaplain, I got to work with my dad. Uh, my younger brother now teaches Oklahoma history at McGinnis, so we kind of joked around on the last year and a half I was there that it has become uh, Grover High um, because we had Father Grover, Mr. Grover, and uh, Deacon Grover. Um, actually, I went by Father Danny because it was too difficult for some of the students because even though me and my dad are about six inches different, it's hard to understand that Father Grover is the son of Deacon Grover, who's the father of, no, <laughs> Mr. Grover, Deacon Grover, Father Danny. Um, and so um, many of you guys know my dad passed away about three years ago. Um, and so it, it's been very humbling um, that the last mass I actually got to celebrate with him it was a quarter school mass. We used to have all school masses at McGinnis, and then COVID kind of shut us down. And again, hindsight, the Lord just puts the right things in your mind and in your life at the right time. I had preached in the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It was October 1st of 2020. October 14th, Dad died. And by the grace of God, on the 7th of October, when he got checked in the hospital at Midwest City, I had to call the president of the hospital to be able to go in to anoint him because they still weren't letting priests even in in a lot of the hospitals. And by the time I got there, they said, Father, you are the first visitor we have had on this unit in over six months. I got to spend about 35 to 45 minutes with my dad. Hadn't actually tested positive for COVID at that time yet. We knew he had it. Um, and so I had to go in. Um, he had been intubated already. Um, my dad's a horrible patient, always been a horrible patient. So they had to strap him down to the bed because he already ripped his um, lines out three or four times by the time I had gotten there. Um, and so I went in, um, anointed him and said, Dad, the same thing they said to him my first year in seminary, actually, when he we went to the hospital. I said, Dad, if it's your time, we'll figure it out. We love you. We know you love us. Do what the Lord calls you to do didn't realize that that was the last time I could talk to my dad. But it was one of the best blessings that you could ever have, offering my dad the anointing of the sick. Um, and so as a priest, it is so important that we have those relationships within our families, but also know that not every priest, every seminarian has a good relationship with their family. Um, we have some guys that join seminary with their parents protesting the whole way through. We have some guys that join seminary that their parents aren't Catholic and are actually anti-Catholic, especially in Western Oklahoma where we're down to about 3.5% Catholic. We aren't the 6% of the 9% in Tulsa. Um, and so specifically, as um, the Bernards were saying earlier, pray for the families um, of those going to seminary because I went from being the forgotten child in my family to the, troub the troubled child that always got in trouble to, in my siblings' eye, the ch this child that could do no wrong, which is ironic because I feel like I mess up all the time. <laughs> but um, all of that to say, it's been a whirlwind um, going through seminary, um, going even getting to seminary, um, and then the eight years that I've been blessed to be a priest so far. I'm talking to Father John Paul about retirement because Richard was saying, yeah, retirement. It's like, yeah, 37 more years. <laughs> Because as priest in our diocese, we can retire at 75. So he's like, 37, I've got 41. It's like, um, but, but, but uh, it's uh, a great blessing um, to be a priest of our archdiocese. Um, and I'm so grateful um, that we have the Sarah Club uh, up and running. And I'm looking forward to it continuing to grow. Questions, comments, concerns? Okay.
So the way that um, diocesan seminaries or diocese seminaries work, you'll go back to work for the diocese um, th that you're going to the seminary for. So diocesan seminarians, yes. If they join a religious order, for instance, Father Simeon, who joined uh, the Benedictines and then went on um, and became a priest, he will always be with the Benedictines, and so they may send him wherever. But for like for me and the guys on our list, they will always be part of the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City. Yeah. 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 Um, which is a whole lot bigger than people expect. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you've ever listened to Catholic radio, you've heard of Deacon Larry Sousa. Um, remember my first assignment, St. Joe's and Norman? Guess who's a deacon at St. Joe's and Norman? So right before I actually got ordained, he said, well, I'm going to get you on the radio. It's like, you're never going to get me on the radio. Yes, I've got a radio face, but you're not going to get me on the radio. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And so um, he said, oh, I'm going to get you on my program. So I, I went on his program, Make Straight Away. Um, and then during the first fall pledge drive, um, I was bored in the office because there really isn't, unless you're in a very active parish as an associate, there's not a lot to do to just sit in the office. I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs some days. A lot, pastors have a lot of paperwork. Associates in a really big parish is like, all right, I'm here. My door's open. And Facebook. Um, and so um, I got really bored. I was listening to the Radiothon. I called in and said, hey, do you guys need any help? Yeah, sure. So I just went up to uh, Tyler Media at that point. Um, and that's kind of how it started. Um, and so I got, got in really good with um, Adam uh, Minahan and David Niles, the Catholic Man Show. I'm actually in their fantasy football league right now. 2-0. Oh. Um, and uh, definitely rub that in if I beat them this year. Um, and uh, just trying to keep in contact with them. Um, and Catholic Radio has been a great blessing, um, so much so that we've actually got a radio station in, in Elk City that we're trying to grow. Um, because Christian radio was a big part of um, my pre-seminary discernment, K-Love, Air One, praise and worship has always been kind of my love language with God, really since that first summer that I kind of encountered God with praise and worship. And so praise and worship to this day when I do my holy hours at my house, I, I listen to it because that's how I speak to the Lord and the Lord speaks to me. Um, there are so many things that I have learned listening to Catholic radio that it's like, that's a great way to put that. Or, ooh, I'd like that story. So I will actually listen to Catholic radio between my two masses in the morning and sometimes take something that I've gotten from Catholic radio and put it into my second homily. Um, the, the Catholic Answers Live um, and all of the other programs that are on there are just so um, amazingly fruitful. Um, and I've been the chaplain for the Catholic radio two and a half, three years now, I think. So it's been a great... Other questions? Yes, Molly. Does that exist? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, well, and I say that, and Father John Paul's like, mm -hmm. so typically my day off is Mondays. Um, I get probably two and a half Mondays off a month. Um, I'm still a kid at heart. I'm 38. I like to play video games uh, still. I've got my Xbox set up in my bedroom um, where I've got a projector screen on the wall. Um, I'm still a kid. So yesterday I was playing um, NCAA 2014 on my old Xbox 360 because they stopped making the game 10 years ago. Um, I watched Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime. Um, watched football last night. My, my newest hobby, because um, we don't have much to do out in Oak City. There's not a bowling alley. There's not a pub. Um, so when I, was in the, when I was in the city, McNelly's was my, I'm going to go to McNelly's. I've got a mug, mug on the wall even with my name. Um, but, but I'd go there and do my McNelly's ministry. Um, and people, McNelly's ministry, really, Father? Well, I'd go um, every Sunday after Mass um, at Corpus Christi, and I'd go to McNelly's, and I'd sit there in collar, um, get a beer, watch football, get a burger, and I'd be there if people wanted to talk. If they wanted to talk, awesome. If not, I'm going to eat my burger, drink my beer, and go home. Um, but I helped five people come back to the church. Um, I actually did RCIA at the bar with one guy. Um, I had a, one couple, after I talked to them for seven and a half hours at the bar, that wanted me to fly to Vegas the next weekend to uh, do their wedding at the Bellagio. Um, I said, sorry, we don't do that. Um, but, but I only had two at that point. The, the, the nice thing with, with McNally's and Corpus Christi, two miles. I've walked it multiple times, um, both there and back, because I was trying to work on losing some weight in that. Um, but my newest venture is going to sound ridiculous. It makes me sound like an even bigger kid. Um, TikTok. Um, Catholic Radio got me on TikTok. Um, they wanted me to go on there to promote our things. Like, sure, I can do that. 
Um, well, but then I also found that there's really cool things on TikTok, like sports cards. Um, I, I collected a lot of football cards growing up. Um, and so now I buy and sell sports cards on TikTok. Um, and so um, it, it sounds ridiculous, um, but everybody's got a hobby. Um, and so um, I've got a large, large, large collection. Um, and I go on there unabashedly, it's Father Danny. So I'll go into people's um, live uh, videos and like, oh, Father Danny's here. And so um, the community of about 10 to 15,000 people that spell, sell sports cards on TikTok know who Father Danny is. Oh, how cool is it to have a Catholic priest that's wanting to talk to us about sports and cards. And also if we have any prayer requests, um, they make those as well. So um, that's my newest hobby is buying and selling sports cards. Just gets really expensive sometimes. <laughs> It is, well, well, and that's the, um, w one of my classmates once said, Danny, you need to get off social media. I said, you need to get on it um, because, and I really found this during the COVID period when everyone was stuck at home, there is such negativity on social media. It is our job and responsibility to put the positivity out there. People say, that, oh, my feed just has negative. Well, get rid of it. Um, I, I make sure at least once or twice a week to share out something that's going on in the diocese, to, to uh, reshare a post that someone had about the faith, to occasionally put many homilies on there or reflections on, on things. Um, I was one of the first priests in the diocese, I think, um, to live stream a mass on accident. Um, <laughs> well, we, we, at the beginning of COVID, um, we were trying to figure things out because we'd never live streamed before outside of like Christ the King that had been doing it forever um, in the cathedral that I think had it set up. So we used my phone, I put it on selfie mode on Facebook and said, all right, we're gonna try this. Um, to which Father Stansberry would never let me live down that before my first mass that I had on there, he heard a toilet flush. It's like, it wasn't me, it's my secretary. Could have been me. But, um, but, but, but just kind of learning those things of um, live streaming prayer. Um, so, so for the first year or so of COVID, um, really all of 2020, live streamed every mass. Um, I do adoration live streamed. I do morning or evening prayer live streamed. I do a, hey, I'm gonna go on a walk and do a prayer walk. What do you guys wanna pray for today? Or what's going on in your life type things? And we can all do those things. Um, and, and it is such a, I think, lost form for many of us that we have to actually reach out to each other. Um, and if you don't like what you see on the internet, do something about it. Um, and so I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and I've got, um, I started um, doing Instagram because Father Brian was doing it when he was the chaplain at McGinnis. Um, when I was the chaplain at McGinnis, I'd take videos of the guys on the football field and I'd go out there and, and I'd post the videos up like, oh, Father, we made Father's Real this week. And it's like, that's good. Um, so, so the kids begin to enjoy those types of things. Um, I had a kid just last summer that had a quinceanera that, that uh, we live streamed her mass. And then she took my homily from the live stream and put it over her video that she did um, for her quinceanera when I was talking about how she's called to adulthood. And it's like, huh? it's one of those, it's making a difference in some of these kids' lives. Um, so uh, social media is, I, I, it has a lot of great potential. It can be an addiction, just like anything else can. Uh, too much of anything can be bad. Um, but I think it's incumbent upon us as priests, as deacons, as lay people to put out the good word out there. Because if we don't, no one else is going to either. hanging out with the kids. Um, I, I, I am a firm believer that if kids see a fun, joyful priest, they will see it as a potential um, vocation. Um, I also talk about it a lot. I talk about my, about my own vocation. Um, it, it, just like um, Christ says um, in Scripture, prophet's not a welcome at home. My kids at the parish are like, oh, Father, you're so boring. But I go out to other places, they're like, oh my gosh, there's a young, eventful priest. This is so cool. Um, and, and so... Um, I try and be as engaging as I can, um, like I was at McGinnis. Uh, if you've ever seen me at a football game at McGinnis, I get a little ramped up. Um, I like my sports. Um, I get a little loud, try and get the crowd going. And I was the mascot my senior year at McGinnis, so it just kind of stayed with me. Um, but, but a lot of it is um, trying to be around the kids, pray with the kids, go on um, conferences with the kids, do retreats for the kids, teach the kids. Um, the last two years, I taught an adult ed class at the same time um, that the kids' classes were being taught. Um, because I am a firm believer that if you don't get the parents, it doesn't matter what you do with the kids. Um, because most of our kids don't accept the relationship with God for themselves until their end of high school, beginning of college anyways. 
So yes, you can plant the seeds and you want to make sure to plant the seeds with the kids. But if the parents don't bring them to church, it's so easy to lose some of our kids. Um, and so I talk about vocations a lot. Um, every mass we pray for vocations. Um, I make sure to talk about it probably eight to 10 times in a homily every, every year. The ACA talk that I give every year, I always talk about the largest line item in our diocesan budget, seminary education. Um, people don't realize that on average per seminarian per year, $50,000 for their education. And so typically the parishes that I've been at, our, our ask between the two parishes has been $50,000. So I, I talk about it in the sense of, if you want to have a priest here after I leave, pay for their education this year, give to this. Because if you aren't going to give us your sons, we need you to give us your money so that we can continue to educate other people's sons to be able to do um, vocation ministry. So, yeah, yeah. B both and. Well, and, and so, um, like when I was at McGinnis, talked about it a lot, um, I invited some priests, different priests in. Um, but also I was in the classroom um, twice a week when I was at McGinnis. I had, I had the freedom. Um, praise God, we have two of my former students in seminary, um, in Rendon Chambers and um, Henry Wynn, of which I can't really take credit for either of them, but I'm going to. Um, no, uh, a lot of that had to do with the parish, had to do with their families, um, Father Novak, and now Father John Paul being their pastors. Um, but yeah, so... Um, there you go. So, um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just not shying away from the hard conversations. Um, every year, um, we have multiple times where, like, we have our uh, we we do our own summer camp um, at uh, Robbers Cave, um, and so we go out there, which is a four and a half hour drive. But um, we go out there this year. We had I think we only had thirty seven kids this year. Last year we had like fifty seven kids. We go out there, and every night we have a powwow where we go around and talk about the faith, talk about what's going on, but also I'm hanging out with them. I'm playing football with them. I'm dunking them in the pool. I'm dunking them in the pond. I'm out there and just being a young, youthful, tell my body that, youthful um, priest and just trying to let them know that you don't have to do things a specific way. God is calling you as you, not as someone else. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.